The opinions you hear on Your Mountain from individual hosts or guests do not necessarily represent those of Your Mountain, our sponsors, or other entities we're affiliated with professionally or otherwise. There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is Your Mountain. Hey everybody, welcome back for another episode of the Your Mountain Podcast. I am your host, David Wilms, and I think because of some threats that Nephi and I made last week to put out open auditions for a third host, Mike McGrady made every effort possible to join us today. Uh, yeah. In fact, I, I, and I, Nephi's here too, but he, I, I want to focus on you for a second, Mike. <laughs> hey yep. Nephi, Mike, uh... <laughs> So we've been working under this presumption for the past several weeks that you are just overwhelmed and crazy busy, uh, you know, getting your feet under you with new, your new job. And, and, and so we've been carrying that load of, of moving this podcast forward. Mm -hmm. And then we find out, then we find out that you go fishing. Yeah, I did. And yeah. And that maybe, uh, you're, your absence isn't because you're overwhelmed at work. It's because you're uh, fishing wedding instead. line at play. Well, I was kind of working. I, I mean, I don't oh, want to yeah, get into well, details kind about of working, it, but it, you've it, said but enough. I, I, I took, I took a former guest to next week's guest's place to go fishing. Um, I still don't call that work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you the best fishing I've ever had in that place happened today. I think you hit it just right, actually. I absolutely did. I have never seen that many browns rise on dry flies in fast water. I, I mean, I, I thought I was, I thought I, it's where you would fish normally for rainbows, and suddenly the browns are coming up, hit the hatch, match the hatch. It was beautiful. It was awesome. Yeah, I w I've actually. I was exchanging some text messages earlier today with one of our former bosses, uh, not one of Nephi's former bosses, if that narrows it down. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we were talking about Pete? potentially, <laughs> potentially <laughs> fishing the, uh, the Laramie river this weekend. And now I gave away the exact I, river you were on. You, uh, but <laughs> I, yeah, I was on the big Laramie and I was using a five weight and, uh, they were doing well on patterns that look similar to, mosquitoes like a size 18 and then eventually um like a drake hatch came up i mean they were giant bugs coming off the water uh it was it was just phenomenal it was great fishing well i'm excited i'm gonna get out this weekend uh, yeah. i won't i won't have the elbow room you had let's put it that yeah, way right yeah uh, well you know i i did happen to find some private water where the fish are not as educated yeah i'm i fished that private water yeah, uh, probably didn't have the same kind of success you had today, but maybe I'll make a phone call and fish that private water this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, welcome back. Uh, we're still taking open auditions. And in fact, Nephi and I were talking about maybe having to have you re-audition for your part here. <laughs> we weren't talking about that. Just so we're clear, no, we were, I'm not no, sure we who Dave was talking to <laughs> about that, but yeah. uh, no, no, we were not. No, even though I know, you know, Chris Timison wants it badly. We were actually Once talking about spot. the idea of adding, yeah, we, a, adding a guest. We should guest. have Chris on, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were talking about the idea of, we were literally were talking about the idea of, should we have a guest host? And so, hey, weigh in. Like, sometimes it's just, you know, uh, it's just Dave and Mike or just me and Mike, which is very entertaining, I know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's just two of us. And so we thought, well, should we add a guest host who's just kind of, if one of us can't be there, is always there? I don't know. Yeah, I think we yeah. could we could spread it around. I think I think I think it's a good idea. Well, that's that's me. Listeners, let us know. Uh, shoot us an email: your mountain at it's your mountain dot com. Find us on all the social media channels. You know, the Twitter, the Facebook, the Instagram at the handle at it's your mountain. And know that we listen because we did. It was either a week or two ago. We asked for feedback on whether we should continue going with these every other week episodes or get back into our weekly cycle. And to a person, everybody that reached out to us said, 
go back to doing them once a week. So that's why and we're back. So so we're back and we're doing them once a week. Yes. And we're excited about that. And it's I'm actually glad we are. There's a lot. If we had to wait another week, we would have missed a lot, missed a, missed the boat on a lot of action that's going on right now in the, the wildlife and conservation world around the country. So I think with that, that's a, that's a good way to pivot into today's discussion. Um, we have, we have one big topic we're going to cover and we touched on it in our last episode and it's about the, uh, about the, the sort of the struggle that's been going on the, uh, between the National Park Service and the, the Alaska Game and Fish over the past several years about you know, how to, who and, and how to manage wildlife on national preserves in Alaska. We're going to get to that and we're going to have a, a deep dive into that discussion. But really quickly, I want to inform folks on there are two things. In fact, as one of these hit the press within minutes uh, of us recording this podcast. And so this is our opportunity to you know, really own up to really missing the mark on something from about a year ago. I think we should uh, just make this a reoccurring thing that we always do is say how wrong we were about <laughs> William Perry we, Pendley. Just yeah, from we now on. So, like, yeah, we yeah. were so wrong. Yeah. Uh, sorry again. Yep. The, the president announced uh, that he is going to formally nominate William Perry Pendley to serve as the director of the Bureau of Land Management. And if you'll recall, last year we mentioned how this was a temporary appointment and it would expire around the end of September. And then then we had to say, well, it was re-upped. And then, yeah, it was re-upped. Uh, but he was never formally nominated. And... Now he will be, and I, and I'll be honest, I find the timing of it a bit curious. Uh, and this is just, I don't know if, if this is a pure, if this is truly a tin hat theory or not. And I'm interested in, in your guys' thoughts on this. Um, but the timing of this seems odd because you have, uh, Mr. Pendley, who is, as we all know, an incredibly polarizing and controversial, uh, person to be running the Bureau of Land Management. With a great uh, mustache. With a great mustache. In fact, the, the, there was a great meme that was going around comparing you know, that had him next to uh, the Tiger King. You know, what, what's his name? That, uh, Enough uh, that said. TV show. Yeah. They, they look pretty similar. <laughs> <Joe>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> I digress on that. But I find the timing interesting because you have a nomination coming in June of an election, a presidential election year, but also you have, uh, you have key Senate races that are up for grabs. And, and so to nominate somebody right now at a time where, you know, Senator Cory Gardner in Colorado and Steve Daines in Montana and McSally in Arizona and, and other Republicans are facing the prospect of very contested general elections at a time also in a year where it's, you know, the, the Senate could go either way. Is it going to stay Republican? Is it going to go Democrat? It seems odd to make a very controversial nomination. So are you going with the time. theory? Because this is very entertaining to me right yeah, now. Yeah, I have so a theory. So are you going with the theory now? We're going to, because I will roll out this theory and will tell me if it's the same one. That the idea here is we put this really controversial name out there that we know um, is controversial so that um, Republicans can vote against him. If, uh, is that what you're saying? No, actually it's not. I, in fact, cause that's, I, cause go, that would have been I'll my theory the, is like, Hey, let's yeah. throw something out there that makes it look like, Hey, look, you know, yes, we know that you all hate this. You know, that we know that if you lean left, you didn't like this guy and I don't like him either. And so I'm voting against him and therefore I am, I am, I am not with, you know, I am, I'm independent minded and I'm an independent thinker. So that's the, then that's the theory I'm, I'm rolling out there as to how, how, why you would do it. But then wouldn't that be bad for the president, though? I mean, why would the president roll out a nomination going into an election that then gets voted down by his party? Uh, it, it, I think that's there's a calculus there that's questionable, which is why my theory is that 
he never actually gets a vote. Like this, like he's nominated, but never actually comes to vote. And my theory is, is this, uh, just to put it out there, there is currently a lawsuit pending that's challenging the appointments, the non, you know, these, these appointments that are supposed to be done through temporary appointments, confirmations, that are these, right. These temporary appointments that are permanent. That's, yeah. you said it better than I would have. Um, there's a lawsuit challenging that. And my theory is that this is an attempt to moot out that lawsuit, to basically say, be able to argue, well, now we've nominated somebody, and as a nominee, they have X number of days that they can serve in that acting capacity while they're going through the confirmation process, and therefore the claims in the lawsuit are, are now moot. Um, and But then still, senators aren't going to want to vote on it because – you know, my theory anyway, senators don't want to have to vote on it. And the president doesn't want to see a vote on it because he doesn't want his nominee to get voted down. Yeah, uh, you know, and so the, it just sits there in purgatory through the election. Yeah, maybe. yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't really moot it. I mean, there's the capable of repetition yet evading review. And sure. A few, but it, a few other theories that prevent uh, an agency like that to say, oh, well, we changed our mind at the last second. Judge dismissed the case. Because the judge is smart enough to know that if he dismisses the case, they could turn around and do it again. And it just is a, a farce at that point. But, sure, but it's an argument that they can make, right? I mean, they've at least created a, an argument sure. to try and get out and, and see if a judge will buy it. Yeah, yeah they'll, make, they'll make that argument. First, they'll make the argument that they're a federal agency and therefore they're entitled to a presumption of regularity. They are not doing anything bad. Uh, and so the case is moot. But that's not going to fly. Anyways, yeah. I, I, I think I think he might get a vote. I mean, uh, I think for the remainder of this year, there will be uh, a couple of things that will be on tap and uh, and will be the focus of, of Congress. And that will be largely around um, cops, uh, race relations, coronavirus, and that will push aside most all legislation. They may have to do continued resolutions. They may punt on National Defense Authorization Act, maybe get it through. Other than that, they'll just kind of churn through the regular nomination process in the background. So I want to talk about Rawa in just a second. But so you so you're saying, Mike, that you think you think there will be a vote. Nephi, you're saying you think there'll be a vote. I'm saying I don't think there'll be yeah. a vote. One of and, us and where is I'm going to disagree right. with you. Where I'm going to disagree with you is I think that I would want to be able. You said, well, they're not going to want to vote. I actually I would want to be able to vote because if you are a vulnerable um, Republican in a purple state, um, this vote helps you. Now, it might not help you with the president, but it helps you with your constituency. Yeah, well, that's my point is is, yeah, it does help you with your constituency. But then what does it do to your relationship with the president? And does the president want to nominate somebody that's not going to get confirmed coming up on an election? Uh, I recognize we're not talking about nominating your secretary of defense or uh, you know, director of Homeland Security or one of these high profile positions. It's, you know, director of BLM is important to people like us, but uh, to, uh, uh, you know, for the people across the country as a whole, collectively, it's probably a relatively minor one, but you still don't want to take a loss like that, which is why I just wonder if, if that nomination languages languishes until November, and if he prevails in the election, uh, then then you kind of get a lame duck confirmation, uh, and because then those senators that that uh, you know they can support the president after the election uh, and vote to confirm, uh, whereas ne- if they were to do that vote now, they'd have to vote no. But that's why this is fun because it's all pure speculation. And, and pure speculation. We've been wrong about everything Pendley related up to this point. So, so we're going to, but, <laughs> but we're only, but somebody's going to be right this time. It's the last or, exciting part. At least, at least partially, right? Yeah, because yeah. The, everybody on the podcast thought like we knew exactly what was going to happen last time. So at least this time we yeah. know that one of us is kind of like, because we're not all lockstep, yeah. there's opportunity. Split opinion is good sometimes, right? Yeah. It's it's good that we don't have just the same view on everything all the time. I think it's 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 worth noting as people watch, you know, Mike, you talked about the things that are likely to move in Congress and the things that aren't, that there is some effort and people should know about this. And if you are touching base with your organizations uh, that you're members of and whatnot or and your and your uh, elected representatives, 
there is effort to ta- to attach the Recovering America's Wildlife Act to something else that is going to be moving to something else that you know uh, you know stimulus through infrastructure or something like that. There's a lot of discussion about you know is this is this the time for that? So be aware. Um, we may come back and talk about that, but we want you to think that we're geniuses if uh, if it passes. And we told you here first that it is going to get tied to something else that's important. Um, yeah, we will touch on it. Just just as a reminder uh, of what Recover America's Wildlife Act is, we've talked about it a couple of times. But it, because recently we've been talking about the Great American Outdoors Act, don't want to get that confused with Recovering America's Wildlife Act. You know, Great American Outdoors Act. They're, yeah. they're very different. Yeah. Um, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act uh, would use uh, royalties from offshore oil and gas leasing um, to to fund states, to you know, create a pool of money that would go back to states to fund and if the implementation you hate all of these state, ideas. Of, hang on just a second. Go, go back to states to fund uh, the implementation of state wildlife action plans, which are really yeah. the state identified species of special concern. Yeah. Not necessarily threatened and endangered, but species that right now are underfunded because a lot of agency budgets are, are going to other species. Yeah, I just wanted people to know if you hate all these ideas, don't worry, because as soon as we're all driving electric cars, doesn't matter. Yeah, there's no money for any of this stuff anyway. So um, as soon as we're, car, you know, carbon free, bang, we don't have to worry about LWCF. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So on we go. I actually now I have to go back and check. My recollection with the LWCF reauthorization uh, is that money, they actually, the money source would come from also uh, some renewables. Is that, am I not remembering that right? I don't recall that. Right? that. Yeah. I think it was the original, I think it was pulling from the same location. And that's part of the beef that, and I could be wrong on this, um, but that's part of the, that's part of the beef or the effective argument against um, both the, uh, both uh, LWCF permanent reauthorization and, and anything that's touching the funds is some of the biggest opponents of the bill have said, well, you can't fund this in perpetuity because it's coming out of this pot and it won't work, you know, because. Yeah, no, I've heard that. I've heard that argument. And I certainly don't want to imply that there would be enough revenue from alternatives to replace the, yeah. the revenue coming from uh, fossil fuels. But I, for some reason in the back of my mind, I thought they had done something with that where, where there was at least some kind of trickle of revenue coming in. Well, from we'll, we'll come back to but it. But I, I, I could be totally wrong about that. There's so many things going on. I get some of this stuff mixed up sometimes. Um, second thing we wanted to talk about. We've done two episodes on this, this particular case, actually. Uh, so for more information, go back for the detailed information, go back to those uh, episodes. I'm sorry. I can't remember exactly which ones they are. Uh, but this is the, Herrera v. Wyoming case. And for those that don't recall, this is the case where a Crow tribe member came into, uh, who Crow tribe is located within the geographic boundaries of the state of Montana. Uh, the, and the member resides on the Crow tribe reservation there. And he came into Wyoming during a closed elk season and killed an, an, with a couple of friends and killed a number of elk out of season and was charged for that, for killing elk out of season. And his defense was that, that he had a treaty right a, 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 from an 1868, the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie had a treaty right to hunt the unoccupied lands of the United States um, so long as the game shall persist. And that case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and, a, and the, the court issued a decision. Um, now it's been about a year ago, I guess. And that decision uh, said that, one, uh, the establishment of the state of Wyoming did not eliminate that treaty right, and neither did the creation of the Bighorn National Forest, which, <clears throat> which is the forest in, in which uh, Mr. Herrera and his friends um, killed these elk. And I should note that his, his, the two hunting friends he had that were also cited pled guilty, paid their fine. It was Mr. Herrera uh, that, that did not, that challenged this. So it went all the way to the, to the United States Supreme Court and that the Supreme Court made that determination, but it did not go so far as to say what lands are unoccupied that, you know, only, only that there could be unoccupied lands that the creation of the forest didn't uh, 
didn't create occupancy of all lands necessarily that there could be unoccupied lands. So the Supreme court did not weigh on that in on that. And they didn't weigh in on whether uh, any, uh, any tribal hunting exercising that right in Wyoming would be subject to the game laws of the state of Wyoming. So that case all the way to the U S Supreme court and it was remanded all the way back to the circuit court in Sheridan County, Wyoming. And the, you know, there was a series of, uh, of, uh, of arguments made. We, we're not going to, we, we might do a more, once we get the official order, we might do a more deep dive here. We're just kind of giving you the summary. Um, but after further proceedings in front of the circuit court, the circuit court last week, uh, or maybe by the time you listen to this, it'll be 10 days or so ago, uh, m- rendered a decision that said, it, that the the tribal members exercising that right due to what is called the doctrine of necessity uh, is subject to the game laws of the state of Wyoming. A conservation necessity, right? And yeah. And conservation necessity being we have a finite resource and a lot of people that want to hunt that finite resource. And if we didn't have, uh, if we didn't have laws to restrict time of use, number of people that can hunt, you know, so forth that we could over hunt and, and these populations could crater. And so that under that doctrine, uh, that in, in order to have the conservation of elk, for example, that the tribal, uh, the, the, to exercise the tribal right, they would have to be subject to state law. I don't think they went so far as to, they, they just, the court just made that finding, didn't go far as to say what that would look like, how you'd fit that into the state system, just that it has to be subject to state law. Um, there, I, I believe Mr. Herrera has 30 days from that decision to file an appeal. And I think this is one where the three of us might agree that that appeal will likely be filed. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. <laughs> I think that's right. And just to, I guess, add a little bit of information for, so people can understand it better is when you describe the circuit court, we're talking about the state, uh, a state court that is in many locations similar to like a county court uh, or more local type of state municipality or state court system that uh, has misdemeanor type criminal offenses. And then if the appeal goes, it goes to the district court in Wyoming, which is basically what we all think of as, as uh, you know, the, where laws happen or, or uh, cases occur. That's, different than a federal circuit court. That's something different. So, um, so we're really talking again about a minor misdemeanor offense and its implications on what a state can do, what treaty rights mean. Uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating that it's just involving hunting at this stage. Right. It, and it's so fascinating that that's something that's starting at such a, uh, at this state circuit court level may make its way back to the Supreme court, U.S. Supreme Court again and have implications far beyond Sheridan County, Wyoming. So we will keep you posted on what goes on there, but wanted to let you know that that decision did come out uh, within the past 10 days or so. All right. Those are the two. And I think those are pretty big current events that have happened since we last recorded a podcast. Uh, but there's a third one that happened. And actually, this one happened just probably just before our last episode. And that's why we we teased it last time and wanted to talk in more detail this time. And you know, for this one, we're heading back to Alaska. And to be clear, before we start this, this is a very uniquely Alaska situation that we're talking about. Is it, Dave? Uh, but, uh, yeah, I was, you didn't let me finish my sentence. I had the but. I was going to say but. I know, I just wanted to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, this particular one is u- uniquely in Alaska, but... Things like this, it, it's not far fetched to believe that this that this type of situation can happen, and in fact does happen in certain cases in other parts of the country. It's just the type of land we're talking about here is me, very uniquely Alaska. Yes, and so before you get into the types of lands, I will say you just talked about Herrera, how something starting at a very basic level could have massive implications. I'm one sure. of the conspiracy theorists who believes that this is one of those areas where. If you allow the camel to get its head under the edge of the tent, 
the whole camel can come in eventually. And so that's where this to me is a, is a very interesting subject. I, and, I, see, I see it as an interesting sort of, uh, there's an ebb and flow that happens, a back and forth of federal control, state control. And we're seeing a time in which federal control over certain activities on, on that land is going to pull back. And then the state control is what's going to fill in the void. That's yeah. what I think. Well, let's, so what is it? What are we talking about? All right. I'm going to say what we're going to talk about, but I'm going to put one one more piece out there, and it's to say, just so you guys know going into this, and so listeners know, I'm going to play a lot of devil's advocate here. Okay. Uh, That's great. And I'm just, that means I'm just lots te- of arguing. Yeah, I'm just this teeing awesome. that up right up front, just so you know. Um, okay. Because I think it... Well, you're wrong. You know, I, want to, I want to make sure, and I'm afraid that it won't happen, I want to make sure that that we explore all sides and positions of this particular issue and, and try and understand where uh, different groups are coming from with respect to this issue. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to play devil's advocate here okay. because I already know where you sit on this Nephi and I guarantee really? I know where, where Mike sits on this and I probably sit in the same place. And so we need to have, I'm going to try and provide that diversity of thought on this issue. If just so you know, so you don't, okay. you don't have to lambast me. Don't lambast me in the middle of this thing. And you can't say, buy integrity. Hey, Dave. Horrible person. Yeah, so here we go. Um, let's tee up first of all, what happened and then we'll backtrack just a little bit. Uh, so earlier this year, earlier this year, in fact, it was in June, June 9th, uh, the National Park Service through the, uh, which is part of the Department of Interior, issued a final rule that goes into effect on July 9th. So this is about to, this will, this is about to go into effect. What this rule did was for the most part, repeal parts of a 2015 rule that was put in place by the National Park Service uh, under the Obama administration. Now, I'm going to go back to that 2015 rule to tell you what that rule did. So then we can talk about what this rule repeals. So here's what happened. And and I want to say here's what happened in 2015. But really, you you have to go back much, much farther than that uh, to learn, you know, what really happened. But in, in 2015, after, let's just put it this way. So the states, as we all know, and we talk about all the time, the states manage wildlife, right? Most states in the country have some kind of a statute that say wildlife is the property of the state, and they've established a game and fish commission or a fish and game commission and an agency to manage that wildlife, and all the wildlife management is subject to the states, right? Uh, Which then lends itself to conflict when you have, uh, over the past 120 years or so, uh, through various federal laws and related Supreme Court opinions, a perceived erosion of that state authority or, or, or ability to manage that wildlife. You have laws that put, are put in place at the federal level that are Restrict what states can do. It tells states what they what have states. to do, restricts yeah. how they can do certain things. So that's what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so one of those laws in Alaska, one of those laws that went into place was in 1980 the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. Now, we could do an entire episode on what that is, uh, and I don't, you know, and maybe we will someday. Uh, But really, for purposes of this discussion, think of it this way. The, the The Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act set up uh, a series of land designations over uh, hundreds of millions of acres in the state of Alaska. And one of those designations, and for purposes of this discussion, was to create a number of national preserves. Okay, so what are national preserves? National preserves are not, first of all, they're not the same thing as National Wildlife Refuges. And so I want to get that out of the gates first. The and National that's Wildlife because I'm going to it talk is about important. that. I know you are. So the National Wildlife Refuge System is was you know was set up uh and is 
are lands that are managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they are paid for largely by by uh, federal duck stamp revenues. Uh, that that that's what pays for the National Wildlife Refuge system. And there is hunting authorized. You can hunt on National Wildlife Refuges so long as the hunting is consistent with the purposes of the creation of that act or with that refuge. That's a little different than what we're talking about here on these preserves. The preserves, these national preserves are actually part of the National Park Service, not the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service. They're not national parks in one respect. They were specifically set up to allow for sport hunting and commercial fishing. They are managed like national parks except for that purpose. So they're under the national park system because these national preserves are supposed to be managed like national parks with all the values that you have with national parks with that one big difference that they were set up for the specific purpose to allow so hunting sport and fishing. Hunt, to allow hunting and fishing. Yes. Right. And so a national park for hunting. Basically preserve though, right? Uh, a wildlife preserve for hunting. Um, the, it, no, but, it's a wildlife that's preserve where hunting is an acceptable use. It, but it's a it's a distinction that I think is worth noting between you know so you understand that it's not the same as a wildlife refuge and wildlife refuges were not set up to allow hunting hunting is allowed if it's consistent with the purpose of the refuge these were set up to allow hunting right? okay so there's your your groundwork that that was in 1980 those were set up um, once they were set up the the National Park Service worked with the Game and Fish in Alaska and set up, you know, through a memorandum of, of understanding, laid out a framework for how wildlife management on these preserves would occur. And for the most part, for the most part, the idea was we're going to defer to state management. You know, that that was the general idea with uh, with the memorandum of agreement is state management would prevail unless it was inconsistent with federal law. And in the instance where it'd be inconsistent with federal law, then federal law would prevail and you wouldn't, wouldn't be able to have hunting. For example, you know, if you had a federally listed species on that preserve, a threatened or endangered species on that preserve, you wouldn't be able to hunt it under the state framework. Even if the state wanted to permit it, it'd be in conflict with federal law. Couldn't do it. Right. Um, so management worked there for, uh, like that for a while. Although what I will say, and we'll get to this more too, is over time, the National Park Service put certain restrictions in certain places on the types of, of hunting that could be allowed. And that's what we're getting to here. So fast forward to 2015. And uh, the National Park Service, and this is their account it, coming directly from the Federal Register notice they published in 2015, saying here are the reasons why we're doing this, right? So they say in 2015, the, the, we are going to prohibit certain activities from hunting activities from occurring on these uh, on these preserves. And they were doing it because they felt like Alaska, the game and fish was... The claim. Sudden, the, the, this claim is the claim is that, the, yeah, this, the, the claim is that the Alaska Game and Fish was now allowing certain activities to occur that would be detrimental to the purposes of what the park was set up for, the preserve was set up for in the first yes. place. So, and in order to meet their federally, their federal statutory obligations, they needed to do these restrictions. And so yes. I should, I should, should, I'll run through these restrictions really quick and then I'm going to take a breath so you guys can take over for a second. Okay. Um, Here's so here's what the rule did. I'll just run through what the rule Before did. Before you talk about what we'll, the rule did, so yeah. let's let's just set the groundwork again. So the, they're claiming a need to develop a new rule. The claim being that there's a new management. There's there's new things happening that present a uh, a need for them to implement this new rule because they're worried about this new activity that's going to come in. Correct. That's the claim they're making. Okay, go ahead. Correct. Okay. So so here is what the National Park Service did in in 2015 it became effective november 23rd 19 or 2015 um and it was specific to amending its regulations for sport hunting and trapping in national preserves in alaska one is it set out to affirm that current state prohibitions on harvest practices so it, things that the state had said 
you can't harvest things this way. Yes. They put into this regulation and adopted them as federal re- regulations. So they took state state law and then they they sought to make that state law into federal regulation. Right. Are you know arguably trying to make it consistent and saying we're deferring to state law here. Mm-hmm. Now we can we'll get into why they're you know that's questionable what if that was necessary and what the repercussions of that could be. Um, here's what the prohibitions are. So it specifically prohibited these following activities that were allowed under state law. And I should be clear about this. Though they are allowed under state law, and we'll talk about this more, it's to the extent that which they're allowed is worth, is what we need to talk about more. Yes. Right? Okay. Because just because you can use utilize a certain method of take as a legal method of take doesn't mean it's allowed everywhere all the time by everybody. There's can be restrictions on it still. Exactly. Okay. okay. So here's what it prohibited. Taking any black bear, including cubs and sows with cubs, with artificial light at den sites. Taking brown bears and black bears over bait. Taking wolves and coyotes during the denning season, which basically means taking wolves and coyotes during summer months. Harvesting swimming caribou or taking caribou from a motorboat while under power. And using dogs to hunt black bears here here are a couple so that's the big thing that was actually repealed those those provisions were repealed by the the new rule that goes into effect here are a couple of the other things that were also included in this rule some of which will remain in effect and a couple and i'll tell you which one uh, also won't remain in effect one is I actually really like this one, by the way. It prohibits intentionally obstructing or hindering people that are actively engaged in lawful hunting or trapping. Basically, you can't harass people that are trying to legally harvest game. Yes. States, typically states have laws, anti-harassment laws, but frankly, it was kind of nice to see the National Park Service do that. Um, This one was, I believe this one was repealed, updates and simplifies procedures for implementing closures or restrictions in park areas, including the taking of fish and wildlife for sport purposes. Basically, it was, we need to make it easier to close things down if we feel like we need to close things down. Um, Another one, which, which... I believe stuck uh, with the new rule was not repealed, which was allowing the use of native species as bait, commonly things like salmon eggs for fishing, uh, as long as it didn't conflict with state law. Uh, So uh, that's the gist of what was in this rule. That's the gist of it. And it all prohibitions on certain types of, you know, certain methods of take certain types of hunting, um, basically outlining those in federal regulation. Yeah, In and general, if you'll notice, talking about. yeah, and if you'll notice one thing very specifically, it's very focused on predator species, mm-hmm. right? It has it says nothing about you know any large ungulates or anything else. It's it's very specific to predator species. Yep. It sounds a lot like some of the same, um, frankly, prohibitions and things that are asked for in the lower forty eight by groups who are not fans of hunting. Yeah, and to be fair. I mean, do you know of any place in the lower 48 that allows taking of wolves during the denning season? You know, it doesn't in, apply here, you know, does it? It does. You know, it just doesn't apply. It just literally doesn't apply. Yeah. Right. Um, now, I know, I, I, now I'm going to pile be, on yeah. here because yeah, we got a little. So here's the thing that is interesting that a lot of people don't know. So this, so we had to go through a new rulemaking process to undo the rule. Because that was in 2015, right? But a lot of people, what people need to understand as well as that this was not just on these preserves. So this same, these same prohibitions, the same management methodology, the same paradigm was also uh, by the same administration put into application on the National Wildlife Refuges in Alaska as well. And so they went and did the exact same things on those areas in 2016. And so the USDI published a final rule that preempted state laws and fundamentally changed the federal state relationship in managing those national wildlife refuge, refuge game species, the, the, the populations on there. Um, and basically removed Alaska's fish and games authority to manage 
both for subsistence and non-subsistence reasons, you know, applications there in that case. We're not talking about that new rule. You know why? Because in 2016... You know why, yeah. That rule was implemented close enough, it was finalized close enough to the turnover in the administration that that rule fell under, under the Congressional Review Act. And so that was undone by House Joint Resolution 69. And so that's why we're not talking about this on national wildlife refugees. We're only talking about it on preserves is because Congress, the Senate, kicked that rule out and said, nope, it doesn't stick. It's worth people knowing that was 100% a party line vote straight down the middle. And so it was 52 to whatever. But I mean, it was and the independent siding with the Republicans. So King, but that's exactly what happened in this case. And that's how come we're only talking about this on national wildlife refugees and not national preserves. Go. That's why we were only talking about this on preserves, not refuges. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. I was flipping. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, so this particular uh, regulation was put in place and was time prohibited. It was barred from the Congressional Re- Review Act because you only have a certain number of days uh, before the new Congress. Something has to be enacted a certain number of, of not calendar days, but actually congressional days. Uh, and um, and it wasn't it wasn't done in time. And so it wasn't subject to review. So here we are. Anyway, so that's what we've got. We so that's why the national wildlife refuges we're not talking about them we're talking about the preserves right let's talk about the preserves for, let's talk about these regulations for a minute so i want to talk about some of the justification for this in the first place and then we'll talk by the obama administration then we'll talk a little bit about what's being undone and the justification for it there one of the principal concerns laid out in the 2015 rule was that uh the the game commission in Alaska had had through certain statements and actions made it clear, or at least had indicated pretty convincingly that they intended to reduce predator numbers in certain places to help boost prey numbers, uh, to create more sporting opportunity and more hunting opportunity for these, uh, for large ungulates basically. And the argument from the park service is that kind of management is inconsistent with the authorities uh, uh, under both the organic act and the act that established this, you know, the Alaska national interest lands conservation act um, and how they were supposed to manage for uh, these natural ecosystems and, and balance. And, you know, their argument was, they they would do the same thing if it were reversed if alaska had managed to have way more predators than prey they would say that 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 also is inconsistent with uh, the, the federal law and objectives and they'd have to come in and regulate uh, so that's and and make pro- certain prohibitions on hunting predators so that's one of the that's one of that's probably the biggest justification that was provided was that uh that state policy towards management was inconsistent. And they laid out then also, uh, in order to justify that, how you know, through the property clause and the supremacy clause of the Constitution, how federal law uh, is, you know, how state law has to be subject to federal law. Uh, that uh, to the extent that there are inconsistencies, the state, ha- the state law won't apply if there's a federal law in that space. Right. And, and so they laid out the, the case that they had, uh, that they had the authority to do this, to take these actions and actually that they had done this, uh, over the course of the past 40 years or so. Um, and they didn't cite this much. I actually found this through other sources, but, um, there are a number of other, uh, leading up to this rule, there were a number of actions that individual preserves had taken over the course of the prior decade to uh, to ban certain types of methods of hunting and species of hunting on their various preserves. And this regulation was, in effect, codifying a lot of those prior individual preserve superintendents of those preserves, you know, their actions. Um, so, yeah, that, what a terrible idea. 
What an absolutely terrible idea. What terrible justifications. Like, let's let's let superintendents of d- different locations. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just not a good idea. And, you know, and maybe... What's not a good idea? Allowing the idea that we've had um, superintendents of different locations previously, federal, uh, whatever the unit of land management be, has... has has developed rules that they have been implementing. And now we're just going to codify all those rules because we haven't done it before, but we should have. And then they're going to supersede state management. It's just a really, in my mind, it's not the right way to do business. States are the managers of wildlife um, and they've done a great job. And we all know that the, the proof is in the pudding. States do it way better than the federal government. When you look at what states have done and their effectiveness at it, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where the money is. That's where the expertise is. In general, the federal government is the partner that should be taking the lead from states on these wildlife management issues. Um, that's just that's a that's a, a reality that can be that can be debated, but it can be proven. So but, so oh, go ahead. Oh, go uh, ahead, Mike. That was just, I was just going to ask a question more on did the at the time of the development of these sort of restrictions that incorporated some of the state stuff, but then layered additional things. Um, was there a scientifically validated basis for the regulations? Because it seems more along the the lines of we don't like what you're doing, and so we want to create a federal law to stop you from doing what we don't like. Yeah, so that's a great question. I hope you're asking it because you know the answer. <laughs> um, Oh, foolish day. Yeah, foolish day. <laughs> you're, you're acting like a judge. That's what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that was one of, that was actually one of the arguments uh, against that 2015 rule was that there wasn't enough data presented to suggest that there were population level impacts based on state managed, you know, to predator species based on state management uh, decisions. And I, I, looking through the record, I, it was difficult to find a really comfortable way f- that the, I didn't find that the service really explained that directly, explained that issue away directly, uh, in the 2015 rule, right? It really was, they, they would circle back and cite to specific commissioner statements and, you know, actions that the commission was wanting to take. And certainly there were indications that there were commissioners that were interested in reducing predator numbers in places. Uh, and certainly there are Alaska policies in place that are focused on reducing predator numbers in places when they, when it's deemed appropriate. Um, but they didn't take those statements and translate those into actual data that suggested those numbers had declined significantly to to then put the um you know the the ecological balance in question um but i here here's a question i wanted to ask nephi based on uh the statement you were making before saying how states are the best to do this and i want to put it in the context of recognizing that these preserves are part of the national park system sure right the national park service do states, this is a pretty easy one for you, low hanging fruit. Do state, this is where I play devil's advocate. Do states manage wildlife in national parks? No, but they should. So go <laughs> ahead. Like, no, they don't. Should they? I can make a very compelling argument that they should. And if you look at the National Park Service record on managing species within their borders, it's not stellar. Well, I think that uh, traditionally the, the approach the Park Service takes is a let nature take its course approach. Yeah, it's very effective. Uh, We've all they, seen how well that works to just pretend like we don't exist and just let uh, animal populations do whatever they want to. It just seems like it's really, really smart hands-on management there. See, I'd actually argue something slightly different, Nephi. Well, go for it. Uh, and I'm not playing devil's advocate here. This is just my personal, this is just the way I'm looking at it. The state's do still manage those species. They That's just right. don't happen to manage them within the boundaries of the park. They have to manage those them elk, outside of the boundary. They manage them outside the boundary. That's those right. elk, those elk migrate, those deer migrate, those bison migrate. You know, 
and they're hunted once they leave the park. Yes. And, and, and so they're, you know, what doesn't migrate though, is and this is a real travesty and the people don't see this. What doesn't migrate is the vegetation, the soils and the environment within those parks. And believe it or not, management decisions, the choice to manage or not manage So before I explain what that was that you all just listened to, um, I will now finish the diatribe. So we were talking briefly about the the choice not to manage is still a management choice. And one of the things that you don't get when people talk about, you can still manage those animals because those animals move across the park boundaries. Those animals move from state to state. They're mobile. What's not mobile is the habitat. And there are some, and I am one of those who would say that you can have significant habitat degradation in given areas when you're not managing the wildlife. And there's a reason for that. Mother Nature, for everybody that thinks that we should just let Mother Nature take 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 her course, that Mother Nature is some sitting up there on top of the mountain and kind of trying to take care of everybody and and you know ushering Bambi into the forest and out of the forest, she's not. Mother Nature doesn't care. Mother Nature doesn't have a conscience. Mother Nature is not nice. Mother Nature doesn't care whether you starve to death or whether you're eaten by a wolf. Mother Nature doesn't... She she doesn't... She doesn't care. Mother Nature will come into your house and she will smash all of your azaleas, Dave, and she will denude all of the aspen trees in your yard and ruin all of your new landscaping. That's what Mother Nature will do if left to her course, because Mother Nature really doesn't care how we feel about those plants. What do you think about that? Um, I think Mother Nature really messed up this podcast. That's what I think about that. <laughs> I Yes, she did. I, I, so here's what just it, happened. Yeah. Is we're sitting here on the podcast, right in the middle of that, Dave and I are sitting here, and then all of a sudden we all just freeze because we could hear literally what you're going to hear on the podcast, which was... A massive hailstorm rolling into Dave and Mike's neighborhood and just destroying the neighborhood. Yeah, you laugh um, because it didn't happen to it you happened to me, it happened this to me time. Years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. time. Nephi's gotten walloped before. This one was like a three-phased attack. It started off five minutes of just big hail pieces that broke up easy. Make sure you're clear when you say big hail. I had golf ball sized hail. Yeah, at it my was house. it was golf ball. It was it was nickel. It was quarter. It was golf ball size. You know, when I drove, um, but past it would, but your it house, would break up. I didn't see any leaves, but I also didn't see any golf ball size hail. But they, now well, I saw like eight inches of hail. <laughs> it was uh, all all the golf ball size stuff was buried by phase two that Mike uh, wants to yeah, talk so, about. So 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 for five minutes we got this stuff that's going and breaking up, and I'm thinking, okay, we're gonna. We're going to be just fine. And then and then it was like five minutes of what happened before doubled. So it just really like upped it another notch. And that was fine for another five minutes. And then it slowed down to a lot less, but really thick and hard, yeah. hard hail that just annihilated um, the, the, the 2020 uh, Ford Explorer parked in my driveway. Yeah. Well, Look, here's I, annihilated it. I live on the opposite side of Cheyenne. I'm not joking yeah. when I say I went upstairs, I walked out onto the porch, and I could hear it. Like I could hear it making its way through the like you know a mile away or a couple miles away down that side of town. You could literally hear it pounding stuff. It was. It, I mean, it literally was audible. It was very impressive from from my front porch. I was, I gotta well, tell and you. And on on top Mother of everything Nature, else, she can on do top of everything things. else, on top of everything else, there were uh, we got about you know twenty five inches of rain. At least it felt like. I mean, when I looked out my street, I opened my garage door uh, halfway, about halfway through this storm, and took some video. And it was like a pyroclastic ice flow running down the street. (laughs) (laughs) Like I was looking around like, did some volcano go off and melt some iceberg in this, you know, or melt some glacier. And this is that pyroclastic flow going by. Cause there was, in addition to all of this hail passing through, there were limbs of brand, you know, branches of trees and, you know, puppies and, you know, small elephants and all sorts of stuff. Just, 
I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, there, you, it's funny you say that because we have a retention pond mm-hmm. in our neighborhood uh, as you come into our neighborhood. And two things happened during that storm. And it probably happens everywhere in America when storms like this happen. Some guy went out on his ATV into the retention pond and got it stuck in a drift of hail. <laughs> and then somebody else rescued that person on a boat. <laughs> I... Uh- <laughs> I, and this is where my kids play soccer. So I, mean, this I don't is know, a place. <laughs> Mike, I don't know if you noticed, but as you were leaving the, your neighborhood to see what kind of damage it did to the rest of town, I was driving into your neighborhood to see what kind of damage it did to your neighborhood. So yeah. Watched you pass. It was. Yeah. And we were, we were, I was driving the, I was driving the 2006 Subaru Legacy, which is my, it's my, uh, it's like my Colorado stealth bomber car. Like if you want to not be noticed in Colorado, you drive the little Subaru and then yeah. you're nobody, nobody messes with you. And so, but yeah, we, me and, uh, and the wife, we took a little stroll and saw you and uh, Emily uh, having a nice little drive yourself. Very impressive. But to get back to the point, um, really sorry guys. And, and, but you when know, we started talking about this, it's kind of interesting in, in ways, but truly the the mother nature thing i mean that's the that's the part that uh you know the diatribe that we're going off on is the choice not to manage um wildlife is a management choice and so that's the where we were going on and you know and and chatting it you know that was the diatribe at the time so Hmm. back to bears Yeah, yeah and and we just wanted you to know, as we dive back into, this, we just wanted you to know. I mean, we're recording this now, two days later. Yeah. Uh, the rest of this, so we're trying to pick up where we left off. You know, we're, you know, this happened. We had to pick up the pieces a little bit, get you know, assess the damage, clean up the yards, you know, all that kind of. I had, I actually had flooding in my basement uh, yeah. as a result of this. Turns out, when you get all this hail and it fills all of your gutters, the hail and rain just pours over the gutters and into the window well and then floods the basement. So we had to get all that squared away before we can go back to finishing this episode. And we thought, you know, rather than starting over, you know, we'll let y'all realize that we're, we're humans going through human events, just like everybody else. And uh, we're just going to patch this thing together and, and uh, move forward. Right. Yeah. Ugly. Yeah. Anyway. So back on, back on task. Uh, and I'm going to circle back on your diatribe really quick, Nephi. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I'm going to make, yeah, I'm going to make the the argument for the argument's sake that there are places in this country where it, you know, that it that it actually does make sense to let you know let nature run its course and be nature and and the management being pretty hands off. Um, you know, I, I think for well, example, example of I, yeah. So here's here's what I was going to say. I think for example of a place. Well, first of all, we could talk about all kinds of places in Alaska that are so remote and untouched. The, you know, these massive parks that never see a person. Uh, that that they pretty much can take care of themselves. The human impact there is relatively minimal to non-existent in a lot of places. And you know, even if we do have some hunting in some of these places, it's so negligible uh, that it really doesn't impact you're providing opportunity, but not necessarily management in some of those cases because it's so remote. But the place I'd, I'd point to are some of the national parks and the purposes behind the national parks and the fact that we had in, in the last calendar year, 300, roughly 320 million people visited national parks or monuments. And I can tell you definitively that there that the vast majority of those people probably don't want to see one of us walking out and popping an elk outside of old faithful. Um, yeah, you know, and, and so I, I, I guess my, saying, but- so my, my, my point being, let me finish my point really quick. Yeah. So my, my point being that um, we set up these places. So, so people from all over and all walks of life can come and, and, and see these special places and have an opportunity to see wildlife that maybe they wouldn't have an opportunity to see if there were hunting opportunities and there could be some pretty significant backlash right if if we open up some of these parks and allow regulated hunting when you know like we've talked about you know at nauseum on this podcast how you know 75 we have 75 80 percent of the public that supports hunting but only five percent that actually hunts and i have a feeling that 75 or 80 percent might decrease if they actually saw 
somebody actively hunting in a park. And so yeah, I think I, there are there are places. I hear what there you're are saying. Places for it for opportunity to see these pla- these places. Right? But here's the problem with that statement, and and here's the issue I have with it. The issue I have with it is I think that it perpetuates a falsity. And the falsity that I believe that perpetuates is this, is that when people go to Yellowstone National Park, people who don't know any better, they assume that Yellowstone National Park, where it's hands off, right, that that is natural, that that is somehow represents an ecological balance, when in reality, it does not. And so, and, and, and I say that for a couple of different reasons, for Number one, because anybody who's been into Yellowstone and sees the amount of people there knows that the animals have become so habituated to people and to traffic and everything else that, I mean, you might as well be driving through somebody's neighborhood in, in huge in huge parts of that park. And so, you know, when people see, you know, buffalo just wandering around the road, they think that that's the natural state of buffalo must be just wandering around like they, oh yeah, it's, 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 like it's. It's like this. It's, you know, bears come up to cars and things like that. And the reality is when you go out someplace else where the animals aren't habituated like that because they don't see five gajillion people a year, they don't do that. And so I think that my, that it does, you know, that's problematic. And the other thing that's problematic about it is there's some great studies. And, and you know that we've fixed this to a degree by the reintroduction of wolves in the Yellowstone ecosystem. But when you had undulates there who, with no type of pressure at all, you know what you know what they did to willows. You know what they did to aspens. You know what they did to stream banks. And so if people thought that Yellowstone was natural, Yellowstone was an erosional disaster because you had undulates. You had the reality. They, had, they, were, they were in numbers in that park beyond the carrying capacity of the landscape to handle them and nothing to control those numbers. And, you know, in a natural system, yes, there will be control. Mother Nature, how does she take care of the control? Mother Nature, sooner or later, everything starves to death. And then sooner or later, you know, you get these spikes. You get these, these, you know, this, again, Mother Nature doesn't care. Mother Nature doesn't try and keep an ecological balance. But... You know, things take care of themselves. They just don't take care of themselves in a happy way. And so, you know, that's the, I think, the falsity that that I think we're perpetuating. The other one I would like to say is this, and I think that, you know, people who listen to this podcast are going to understand this. It also perpetuates the falsity of the North American continent as this pristine, uh, like as a zoo prior, you know, where it was untouched by human hands until... Europeans. That's just not the case. Native peoples, you know, when you when you look at the people that were controlling game on this continent, Native Americans were controlling game on this continent long before Columbus sailed across the ocean and planted a flag someplace. They controlled habitat. They controlled numbers. They preferentially looked at different species that they wanted to have around and different species that they didn't. And I think that that's part of the myth that I have a problem with is like, if we really want to set Yellowstone back the way it should be, you know what we should do? We should let those native tribes manage it. There you go. You know, there's, I mean, it's never going to happen, but Hey, want to, you can't, there's not a, the system to believe that the, the natural system existed absent the hand of man isn't true. The question is who it was and what the management paradigm was. That's the, that's the, what I would say. And I know that's not going to be popular and it's not going to win us, you know, votes and it's not, you know, it's not Bambi, but that's, I think that that is something that can't be ignored. Well, so I'm going to, I'm going to do this real quick. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm going to rest on the fact that I, I disagree with the, the, uh, a premise that, um, that every, yeah, I don't want to say that every place should be open for for hunting or some kind of management like that, uh, like that kind of management. I really do believe that there are places that you know we just shouldn't manage that way. Um, but that's actually not. I mean, we went down this gigantic rabbit hole with these diatribes the that was completely that- unnecessary because because what we're talking about, what the whole point of this discussion 
uh, was hunting on preserves that were set aside for purposes of hunting. Right. You know, yeah, we're not, we're not talking, it's, it's not a national, I mean, it's managed by the national park. Yeah. It's part of the national park yeah. system, national park service, but it's not a national park operating under the same uh, guidelines as other national parks now, that would prohibit. Now hunting. I do think right. it's worth so. noting. And I think you are going to note this is that the people who are hunting in many cases in Alaska, these areas are native hunters and they are subsistence hunting. Yeah, that's correct. So that, that, um, uh, and, and I, I apologize here. I don't have, have all my ducks in a row here. Um, but that Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act that we've talked about, uh, during this podcast, uh, several times, right? One of the things in there is it, it made sure, um, that it allowed for subsistence hunting as well, right? And using subsistence hunting, using, more traditional means. Uh, and some of those might actually include, for example, a, taking a bear or cubs In from den. a den site. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how often does that occur? Well, so here's, this is, I, I don't know where we want to go with this. It, it, I don't, I don't think it occurs very often, but here's, uh, let's, do you want to, should we jump to the, the new rule? Sure, and what it yeah. did, and, yeah, and maybe absolutely. some of the some of the critiques of the new rule uh, that I've, wait. I've seen. He's riveted. <laughs> so, or uh, reading or we, reading his stock reports at the same time. That we're talking right, about right. Too. So we've mentioned that I'm, I'm I'm looking at the new rule <laughs> on, the, on the screen. <laughs> oh, it's funny. The new rule is pretty straightforward, right? The or the so that goes into effect here uh, on July 9th. Um, so really soon, this rule goes into effect. Uh, it. And really what it does is it, it repeals the portions of that 2015 rule that were banning these prohibitions, right? Or that would not prohibition, that were banning these different means of take, methods of take, uh, and type, types of species taken, right? That's, that's really what it does. And it's kind of fascinating when you compare the 2015 rule to this new rule, the 2020 rule, we'll call it, I guess. That 2015 rule, and I don't know how many pages it was, it was. It was a lot of pages, right? This new one was much, much shorter. But that first one it was a lot of pages, and I think it was a lot of pages because they were really trying to justify, the administration was trying to justify why it was taking this particular action, why it was imposing restrictions on type of types of hunting and really wanted to lay out the legal argument that it had the authority to do so. And what I found interesting about the 2020 rule is that there wasn't a lot of legal explanation or justification. It was more of a policy argument. It was more of a, look, we, when we, the, you know, this was, these preserves were set up for hunting. We had an MOU back in 1982 with the state of Alaska saying we were going to be deferential to the state of Alaska on their management techniques. Uh, and, and then they cite to, uh, their, their, and they, they cite to longstanding deference to state law. Um, and then they, they point to a non impairment determination that was appended to and this is, I'm now getting kind of technical, but I'll explain it in a second. A non-impairment determination that was appended to a finding of no significant impact for an environmental assessment that was conducted by the National Park Service when doing a review of the 2015 rule. And basically what that means is they were saying, they were going back and doing this assessment and, and asking for data from the state of Alaska and trying to make a determination whether if these means of take were allowed to occur would one would they occur and two if they did occur would they occur at a level that would significantly i don't know if significantly is the right word but occur at a level that would um, change the population dynamics such that they would that they being the national park service would be in violation of their guiding laws on how they're supposed to manage this land like basically would it throw the predator prey balance out of whack 
and and be managing in favor of the prey base at the expense of predators uh, to the extent that it has a population wide impact and then put them in jeopardy of violating their laws. That's what the EA was meant to do. Right. And the the administration reached out to the state of Alaska to get information from a particular time frame. I think it was in the I might get the years wrong, I'll get close, 2012 to 2015, somewhere in that range. Uh, you know, actually the dates that were really preceding the rule that put the ban in place to, to find out, okay, what kind of take was happening, you know, you know, before the ban went into place and the state of Alaska was managing, you know, how many of these animals were taken this way and is it having a population wide impact? Uh, and they concluded that, due to low levels of take and low levels of additional take anticipated under the rule that it, it, it wouldn't have an effect. And they also said one other thing. They said, look, um, we have the authority under the ANILCA. Uh, they have the authority under this act and the organic act that if that did occur or, or they saw that it was starting to occur, then they could step in and put an end to, you know, put an end to those practices. Um, and so they, they said, we're, we, you know, the old rule was really regulating uh, a problem that didn't exist. And, oh, by the way, we have authority to regulate that if it actually becomes a problem. And we don't think it is one yet. So we're going to repeal those. And we don't think it will be. So we're going to repeal those rules. So that's what they did. Um, I will say that, that there, there is a long letter from some former superintendents of a number of these preserves and other parks in Alaska uh, that were to say they were opposed to this rule repeal would be stating it nicely. Uh, They had uh, some, some pretty big criticisms and I think it might make sense. Uh, What I'd like to do, I'm going to put it out here right now for you guys. So we'll be, we'll put, we'll put this podcast out, but, you know, to be fair for transparency, maybe we should also post on our social media sites these regulations and maybe this letter uh, criticizing and also a letter from the Alaska Game and Fish Department saying, here's why it's not an issue. Uh, here's why you shouldn't regulate. You know, just put all the information out there to help people make their own decision on uh, on this rule. So just because I think that's one of the things. What you're saying is that the, 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 the directors... Um the superintendents were in favor of the repeal of the no no they were, they were of keeping f- the old correct the they super thought, they thought the status quo was was right or done yeah. well it was by they the, liked the 2015 administration rule. they wanted yeah. to keep it correct correct and and i will say the letter is mostly from folks that have uh that are are were prior superintendents or have retired uh, yeah, and they aren't currently in that position. Um, here's an interesting fact for you. I'd love your take on this. This is sort of a, here's my slight tangent, but I found this interesting and I'd be interested in both of your takes on this 2015 rule. So the way this works, you know, and you guys both know administration, whatever it is, they propose a rule, they're going to open it up for public comment and then they have to respond to that comment in in the issue of final rule. Um, 2015 rule had 70, 70, 70,000 comments. And of those 65,000 of them were form letters. So there are really 5,000 unique comments, but wait for the next piece. This is the part that I find interesting. So that's the 2015 rule. Remember that number, 70,000, 70,000. That was for putting the, the restrictions in place, yep. the 2020 rule for removing to basically go back to what it was in 2015 or before 2015, the 2020 rule received 211,780 pieces of correspondence and on, on the proposed rule with a total of 489,101 signatures of those 176,000 were form letters and about 35,000 were unique comments. I, I have my theories on why 
we went from 70,000 to 211, almost 212,000. But I'm interested in yours. Well, you want to know some wonky stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have a podcast. Yeah, that's, that's all we do is wonky stuff. For everybody that doesn't know, you know the old process of just taking one. So for people that don't know, there are there are interest groups who have made a science now out of getting comments from people that wouldn't normally put comments in. And the way that you used to do this is you used to – they used to ask for people's email addresses, phone numbers, addresses, whatnot. And then they'd they, – you know, or they'd get you to click on a button and you'd send – a specific form letter, and so all your form letters looked the same. The technology has actually improved significantly now, where they figured out and how to how to not make it look like the same letter, and requiring you to add certain stuff and do certain things to make it so that they're all somewhat unique. Or they feed you the addresses through their system, but still. So it's, I'm just think that it's interesting, and people should know that that they've made it harder because we've gotten better in government at, fi- at finding out that something's a form letter and categorizing them all as such, they've gotten better at hiding that. Now that doesn't mean that they're not, uh, they, I mean, that doesn't mean that these aren't all, you know, you still, that there's not more unique comments in this, but I just wanted to share that piece of wonky information. Here's uh, another piece. I, oh, I, oh, go I, ahead, Mike. I was going to say, uh, I, I would agree with that. And cause I, I mean, I thought about it, it as two ways. Uh, the difference being in 2015 versus, you know, 20, 2019, 2020 timeframe is the technology has exponentially increased to get it to the point where it's a lot easier to get those comments in, uh, and, and organize them in a way that's, that's getting into the, the, the heart of the matter for whatever the campaign is. But I think the other component to it is also that my estimation is, you will see more comments that are purported to repeal or re- or pull back on uh, things that are perceived to be good for the environment, or um, the, you know, it sort of characterizes a rollback on on things that are helping the environment. I don't know. It just seems like it inflames more people, and you get more comments that way. Yeah. I think that's right. I also think there's the fact that uh, building off of your comment, Mike, there's something to be said about the administration we have today and just in the conservation and environmental community, the belief that that, admi- there, that there is nothing. Nothing good comes out of it. If, if that administration is proposing something, you don't even need to look at it. You can just assume it's bad. Despite um, it. Is, is a, there's a mindset out there and it's really got people riled up and fired up and I think causes them to, to engage and submit letters more than maybe they would under different administrations. I think there's something uh, to that too. Yeah. And and there's also the, the, the dynamic, the dynamic in there where if it's, it's easier for folks to sit home and not participate if they agree with it. If they disagree with it, then they're more likely to actually click a button, take action, submit something. And it's and it's really easy to make these things sound bad, isn't it? Like if I if you're going to take, you know, take any we've seen this with hunting and this is how hunting gets attacked. And this is how you lose opportunities to hunt is because if you were to poll Americans in general, poll everybody and like, are you okay with hunting if people use it for blah, 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 for meat? And they, they, as long as it's not sport hunting, everybody's going to be like, oh, yes, yes, absolutely. We're okay with it. And then you start going down the list and go, well, what about long range hunting? What about people who shoot an animal with a pointy object and they, they don't die immediately? Well, what about this type of trapping? Or what if they, you know, what about bait? What about, as soon as you start bifurcating everything and going down, like, you, Literally, you can get every one of them by making it sound the way you want it to. You can, you yeah. can erode each one of those. You know, you can erode anything if you take it that way. And you know, that's, I, oh, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Oh, I, you know, I, I was going to say, you know, I, I, I went into this thing. I was going to play devil's advocate. Here's one place I, maybe I won't be <laughs> playing devil's advocate as much as I as I thought. Um, in a lot of ways, this had felt like. It was regulating based on a sense of morality, uh, uh, meaning a perception of what of what 
the most ethical and moral way practice to hunt is. Uh, and it just felt like perhaps there were people that said, look, I don't think we should be hunting predators, but if we're going to hunt predators, we certainly, certainly shouldn't do it this way. You certainly, certainly certainly shouldn't shouldn't do it over bait. Right. And we, we absolutely shouldn't, shouldn't, uh, you know, take a, a sow and her cubs from their den. And when you hear that, and, and obviously the media hits, has hit that. If you, if you believed everything you read and all the stories about this, and this is one of the reasons we wanted to, to take this topic on. And we probably should have mentioned this at the very beginning of the podcast. Every single media report we saw was so slanted in one direction. It made you think that, that there's going to be an army of hunters going out there and just pulling bears from their dens and there you know, be any left and it was just going to be a, a a predator slaughter basically we're going to kill all bears we're going to kill all wolves we're going to kill them in their dens and people are going to be lining up to do it um and when you really dive into it you you realize that can that happen technically happen under Alaska law in most places, no. In some places, no. yes. But the circumstances are very, very limited. And really, you're talking about subsistence hunters that might take one a year that uh, have to do it because they, you know, they can't get on a plane and fly to a grocery store once a week. Yeah, you'd have to. <laughs> you know, they got to live. You'd have to create a pretty elaborate little storyline to have it occur the way that they're acting like it would. Yeah. And and before we move on, one other wonky thing I wanted to mention on this whole commenting piece, and this is just advice for everybody that's listening. I don't know if we've, if we've talked about this before, but we if we haven't, we should, and we should probably touch on it again. When you submit a form letter to a federal agency, if 25,000 people submit a form letter to a federal agency, that's treated as one comment. And they'll respond to it in in their response as one comment. And, and so, if you want to have an impact, it, the number of people that submit a a form letter is not what creates the impact. It's the number of unique responses or the the unique comments that can create the impact. Ah. And I think that's you. Do you disagree with me, dude? No, it depends. I mean, you were right. <laughs> but the the thing that I would say, <clears throat> if you're looking for backing to come to do an action. So when this first, when this first thing occurred, like when they made, when they, when they developed the rule, I guarantee you that the people who developed the rule, they didn't just say, well, well, it looks like we got 70,000 of them, but it's just, it's one form letter. So we're just going to count it as one. No, they said 70,000 individuals supported our decision. And the, and I mean, why? Because so, and I'm talking about the the maybe not the, the agency heads, but the people who are making those decisions. It's just it's political capital. I mean, just like to be frank, when you look at these comments that came in opposed to the new rule, the one that was just rolled out by the Trump administration, I guess I would ask you just as a question: Does it matter to you if there were two hundred fifty thousand comments? And they're individual. Does that? Do you think that that should change? That I mean, sh- should should people who don't know what they're and I'm just going to be honest. Sh- I mean, I don't know. Honest is the right word. Should people who don't know what they're talking about really make you change your management decision just because they, you know, like you know they whatever just because they have a certain feeling about it? I'm just this is uh, an honest question. Should yeah, it? I know you're you're obviously talking in hypotheticals now because yeah. in 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 reality. It's the people sh- that show up, the people that write letters that actually, like on a Game and Fish Commission. When, you know, I'll give you a, just a small example. Game and Fish Commission, they're doing season setting. They're, they're, they're setting your hunting seasons for the year. And you get people coming in and saying, you know what? I This is the area I hunt in. I, I, I think you should issue is, 10 fewer comments, licenses. Should those comments be informative or are they voting? Does it matter how many? Is the information what's important or is it the number of people you know what's the i mean what do you think well yeah but you you and dave are talking about two different things nephi your point that it's not a democracy is accurate i mean it's not vote counting it's you know right. numbers don't necessarily tell the story dave's point if if i'm if i'm correct you know if i'm interpreting it correctly is that 
if you are going to submit a form letter, it's going to go in a stack and not get read. If you want to have your voice and attempt to influence it based upon information you have, you got to write an individualized letter that communicates correctly your view on things. And that is more likely to be read, deliberated on and considered than you'll ever get out of a form letter that happens to be one of 200,000. For sure. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely the point I was trying to make that you just made much quicker than I did. Uh, well done, Mike. <laughs> uh, so I, I actually wanted to I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit, I guess, as we, as we kind of move towards the finish line of this discussion. Um, one of the things I want to talk about are some of the, the highlights in this really detailed letter from the park, former park service personnel that, that were pointing out uh, different things that, that they, you know, they were arguing about the way to regulate in these parks. But I actually want to go back to a point we made a lot earlier in the podcast, if I remember two days ago correctly, when we actually recorded this. But there was one piece in that 2015 rule and that on its face seemed kind of benign, but actually kind of bothered me a little bit. And I wanted to make sure that we touched on that. So that 2015 rule took practices that Alaska had put in place and so, you know, the game fish in Alaska you know, had certain practices that aren't allowed for hunting, certain methods of take that aren't allowed. Um, and that was adopted in regulation uh, by, you know, through that regulation in 2015. And on its face, you'd say, well, that's pretty benign. It's it's just, you know, state of Alaska shouldn't be too upset. It's just adopting. It's really, in a way, in, in essence, it's deferring to the state because the state took that action and they're saying, we're going to apply that same restriction on these federal lands as well. We're just going to adopt it. Here's, here's why it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. What if two years from now, the state wants to change that? Exactly. You know, and, and, and they say they have new science, you know, new data, you know, just new information or frankly, just make a policy decision that they want to change course on some of those and now you have a, f- a federal regulation that would be in conflict with their state efforts. And so this idea that they're deferring to the states, it, really they're handcuffing the state. They're saying, good job. We agree with you. You can never change. <laughs> um, and, and I know, so like I said, it looked benign on the surface, but that one really kind of, I don't know why, it just really kind of, maybe I'm because I'm kind of a states rights guy, it really, that one really rubbed me a little bit wrong. No, it's it's the wrong it's the wrong way to manage. It's the wrong way to do government. And I know people. I, I'm I'm broken record, but the best decisions are made by people who actually have knowledge of what's going on on the ground. And if you were gonna, it is a terrible idea to try and manage this country from Washington D.C. To try and manage the game in this country from Washington D.C. To try and manage the natural resources in this country from Washington D.C. Because the people who sit in those offices change. We hope. And they bring different perspectives and they, you know, come from different areas. But the problem is their knowledge base is very finite. And so if you want good management to occur, you you really need to look to the people who live in those communities. Like if you're in Alaska and you want the best management of game numbers and species in Alaska – you probably need to ask Alaskans about it. You probably need to get Alaskans to weigh in. You probably need to let them, because again, every management decision or every lack or every decision not to manage is a, it has consequences. It is a decision, the decision to be there or not be there. It changes the outcomes on the ground. It changes the shape and look of things. And if you're not there to look at it and to care about it on a daily basis, if you're just making a gut check based on, you know, you're, you're making a decision based on what you think right now after having read about it for 15 minutes like we do, like the Your Mountain podcast, guys, we should not be making management decisions about fishery numbers in Florida. You know, even if we, you know, read a couple of articles about it, we may have opinions, but we should defer to those experts on the ground, those people who have that local expertise who actually can, you know, talk to and speak to the practices over time that they've used to manage that resource. And that's, you know, that's 
maybe is hard for us if you if you, if you want to have your fingers in that and you want to be in charge of it, it's tough to take that back seat, but it's important to do it and and to have the humility to let people who live there teach us maybe how it can be done better. Yeah, so look, there are 50 different states with 50 different sets of priorities, management priorities for the wildlife within their boundaries, within the boundaries of those states. And there are 50 different states that say, we own the wildlife of this state and we're going to manage this wildlife for in perpetuity for the benefit of the citizens of the state. You know, the whole objective is to make sure that, that the management decisions that the state makes today doesn't have a negative impact on future generations. Everybody's doing can, it right except Texas. Just kidding, Texas. I just want to put that in there. Just kidding. Uh, that's a podcast in and of itself. <laughs> Texas is complicated. Uh, but every state does it different because every state is so different. You know, ge- geographically, uh, politically, you know, there, there are just so many differences that if you tried to have a national system, it would be immensely complex and, in my view, probably destined to fail. Uh, I just don't see a national management system that, that could do it effectively. So, so here we are in Alaska and, you know, kind of trying to move towards wrapping a bow around this. The, the whole idea is from the, the, the current administration and their rollback of the restrictions that, if you want to call it a rollback of the restrictions that were in the 2015 rule is to defer to the state and do really to try and do what, what they'd been doing for the past nearly 40 years up until I would say up until about 2010, it was around 2010 that different uh, park superintendents up there started putting in place prohibitions on, on certain state authorized hunting practices on their respective preserves. And I think I mentioned this before, you know, there, there are four or five of these preserves, uh, four or five of these preserves that th- these individual superintendents put these regulations in place on or, or used their closure authority to prohibit certain state authorized hunting practices. And it was that, that, that was incorporated in 2015 rule. But before those superintendents took that action, for the most part, there's this long standing deference to the state of Alaska and their management. The thing that caused a pivot was a, again, just to reiterate, a thing that caused this pivot from the federal side was this perception. And I haven't done enough of an in-depth analysis to know if the perception is based in any fact or reality, but the perception that the state of Alaska was, was shifting their management direction uh, towards predators to do more targeted predator control to enhance game species. And they felt like that was, was in conflict with the statutes guiding the operation of these national park service lands. So they felt like, and they, and they felt like they, the state was unwilling to work with them to address their concerns and that they were left with no other option, but to regulate that's 2015. Fast forward, and it's this administration saying, you know, based on our assessment and our communications with the state, even if the state's doing what they, what these folks said the state was doing in 2015, it's not going to have that, that negative population impact uh, on the predator species. It's going to impact prey or, you know, raise the prey species in a way that we should be concerned. We should continue to defer to the states. And that's what this rule is intended to do, defer to state management. To be clear, this rule does not say anywhere in the rule, nowhere in the rule. You'd you'd think that based on the media headlines, it did. But nowhere in the rule does it say the federal government says you can go in and and hunters can go in and, and pull wolves and bears and their cubs from their dens and kill them. It doesn't say that. You know, they're not authorizing practices. They're just repealing those prohibitions that were put in place in 2015 and deferring to state management. 
Manager. And if the and if the state says there are certain instances where we think it makes biological and management sense to allow for that type of take to occur, then the state should be allowed to make that decision. And we're not going to step in and prohibit the state from doing that because, frankly, they've been managing these lands since before uh, this 1980 act. And there seem to be lots of bears and wolves. <laughs> right. So, so maybe they haven't been doing a bad job. So it gets back to my point at the beginning on this is a discussion about the ebb and flow of federal and state management. I mean, who, who's really in charge here? And uh, if they can't occupy the same space at the same time in this, in this area, sort of like, who has it? And as, as the feds step back, the state steps in. And so it's not as though there's no one regulating. It's just a matter of deferring to the state or going back to the system of deferring to the state. Yeah. And it's a story as old as time, right? Or at least as old as states. It, there has been this, this tension between the federal government and the states, not just over wildlife management, but all over all sorts of things. Of what is the appropriate role of the federal government? What is the appropriate role of the state? And there's, uh, you know, this pendulum swings some uh, over the course of time. And sometimes there's the federal government asserts more uh, control. Sometimes the states are able to assert more control. And you, you, so don't think that the repeal of this rule is the end of the discussion. And also recognize that yeah, I said this was a, at the very beginning, this, I said this is a very uniquely Alaska situation. And it's, it is because we're talking about these national park preserves that were set up for hunting. But it isn't in the context of, you know, this could have, you know, something like this could and probably has happened in any of your states that are listening right now. Anywhere you're listening, there's been tension between a state wildlife agency and the federal government over how to manage wildlife. And so that's why I say story as old as time. It's just going to, it's going to keep hand, keep happening. So, um, we probably, there was probably a whole bunch of stuff we missed in this. <laughs> and, and, uh, in fact, I know there is a whole bunch of stuff we missed in this discussion. And there are probably, there are probably perspectives that, that we weren't able to cover, to cover as well. It's, it, it's pretty complicated. It's, it's been contentious for, for a long time, uh, would love to, to hear from folks about this. Uh, and, uh, so reach out to us and let us know if you have, if you have thoughts on this yourself. Um, anyway, do you guys have any other thoughts? No, I just feel like this is the longest three day podcast I've ever participated in. <laughs> Mercy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Can I, can I really quick, Nephi, do you have any thoughts? And then I want to prime one last thing as we wrap up. Nope. All right. You're going to listen to this podcast. If you made it this far, thank you so much. And I'm going to put in a plug now. If you are not subscribing to this podcast yet, you absolutely should because our hundredth episode is coming next week and we have got a phenomenal guest and an incredible conversation coming a week from now that you are all going to want to hear. I promise you, you're going to want to hear it. So make sure you download that episode. Yeah, make don't sure quit because you, you hated this one. Yeah, if this one was a little too wonky for you, next week's won't be. If I'm too opinionated. Man, next no, week, we don't have any opinion. <laughs> next week, we defer to somebody on else. our opinion to somebody else uh and you're it, it's going to be we're we're really excited about it you're going to love it so we just we're just letting you know now listen to that podcast um all right i don't have anything else i don't think you guys have anything else we got a lot of cleanup to do a lot of kids to put to bed you know all that kind of stuff um more three-day podcasts to plan so while we're doing all that <laughs> To everybody out there uh, that's still listening, still listening. Yeah. If for everybody out there that's listening, which is everybody that started this, I know you finished it. Remember, life is about experiences. So go have one.